Hey folks, Darren with Fervent Astronomy. Today we're going to be looking at this, the Sigma 35mm f1.4 DG HSM art lens, the one that kicked it all off. Yes, I'm aware that this is not a physical lens. <laughs> That's because, as is often the case, I have lenses coming in and out and not always as much time as I would like and I forgot to film a to camera talking headpiece for this lens. That being said, I did take it out and did take some samples with it. And this is, I don't know, like the sixth one I've had come through my hands uh, over the last uh, few years. So uh, I do have a decent amount of familiarity with this lens. So the 35 millimeter 1.4 is the lens that kicked off the whole art series and Sigma's, I can't remember what they call it, but they're sort of shift to this art sport contemporary kind of uh, delineation with their lenses and it kind of kicked off their launch into better quality products frankly and the 35 mil has been around a long time it's all over the place you can find it fairly uh, inexpensively used you know either from places like MPB, KEH or B&H or just on your local a marketplace on Facebook or Kijiji or whatever Gumtree if you're down in uh, the southern latitudes there so yeah lots of lots of availability price might be right 35 millimeter is good for some kind of like a little bit tighter Milky Way shots and that type of thing is this gonna be the right lens for you well I don't know it's got a nice manual coupled focus ring which is uh, of course it's a bit of an older lens uh, but it is still nice to see and with that nice bright aperture of f1.4 it could be really interesting so since I don't really have it here to show you and you can just look this up on the internet anyway uh, let's jump into Lightroom and see how it performs hey folks welcome to Lightroom where we review an oldie 012 that's 2012 Sigma names all of its uh, or puts that little signifier for the year it was produced on their new lenses Anyway, this is the Sigma 35mm f1.4 DG HSM for pretty much every camera that existed. Even Pentax came out DSLRs. This was like one of the two or three lenses that actually got made for that system before they threw the towel in and decided not to pursue it any further. At any rate, is this lens in 2024 at the time of recording any good? I mean, it's the same as it was, but... Is it something you might want to look at? I know things these days are pretty crazy. It's all kinds of recession and stuff going on. Maybe you can save a couple bucks. Let's find out. So first, this I've got two sets of samples. First set is shot with the Sony A7R Mark V, 60 megapixel camera. Second set is shot with the Sony Alpha One, 50 megapixel camera. Although I must admit, I pulled a little bit of a goof and uh, I don't know if you can see here, 21 megapixels, something's not right. Basically, I forgot my camera in crop sensor mode because I use that camera for wildlife. And when you're doing wildlife, sometimes you only want the center of the frame. So those are only going to be so useful. We'll take a little look at one, but that's probably all we're going to do. Also, I usually shoot to f2.8, but I forgot to do f2.8 in the track samples, I guess. So I was definitely... I guess on May 3rd, definitely firing on all cylinders that night. At any rate, tracked samples here with the A7R Mark V to give us the best look at the aberrations. Tracked with the Fornax Mounts Light Track 2, bomb proof, GOAT Star Tracker, Fervent Astronomy. I am biased because I'm the distributor for North America for Fornax Mounts. So if you have any questions about that mount or you want to learn more, head to ferventastronomy.com. And you'll notice that I'm using ISO 320. For all of my shots here with the A7R Mark V, ISO 500 for the A1. Why am I doing this? Well, it's called ISO Invariance, ISO Invariance. There's more information uh, on my website. You can head to the link. It'll bring you right there. You can get some more info on that if you want to uh, really deep dive. But suffice to say for some cameras, not all, some cameras, each camera is different. They only actually these days tend to have a couple quote unquote real ISO values. So what does that mean? Well, that means that the camera literally will have one analog amplification stage at ISO 100, typically, and then in this case, 320. 
that means every other ISO there is basically faked using whatever the previous base ISO was. So from like, what is it, 125 through to 250 with this camera, it's just taking the ISO 100 image and boosting the brightness. And from everything north of 320 with this camera, it's just boosting the brightness. Literally exact same as if I came up here in the tone control and just cranked the exposure a bit. That's all that's happening. So what does that mean? Well, that means if I shoot at 320 or I shoot at 6400, I get the same data, kind of. I actually get more data shooting at 320, which I'll explain. But I can take this 320 shot, I can side by side with the 6400 shot, I can crank the exposure in this shot and make it look identical to that 6400 shot. I'll get the same noise performance, I'll get the same ability to recover the shadows. I'll get everything the same, except that in this 320 shot, I'll actually be able to recover some of the highlights if they get blown out. So stars, galaxy cores, bright spots in nebulae, think Orion Nebulae where they've got the, you got the star forming region there. All of these areas, if they were to blow out at a higher ISO, but I can retain some information here at 320, it's a, it's a benefit, it's it's win-win. So you can recover more in the highlights doing this, and that's why I choose to do it. That being said, you can uh, find these samples, and uh, along with that explanation about ISO invariance, just head to the description, there will be a link back to the website, and all the relevant links are gonna be there. You can check it out. Please feel free to download the samples, pixel peep, process them, see if the aberrations are you know, something you can tolerate, see if the uh, maybe the camera that you're interested in, see what kind of detail you can get out of it. Please have at her. I just ask that uh, please respect the uh, spirit in which these samples are being provided. They are my copyrighted works, even though they're not by any means works of art, but did require that I get the lens, head out in the middle of nowhere, do all the work. So please don't post them online or reproduce them anywhere. Please don't misrepresent them as your own. Please don't use them as the basis for your own reviews. Uh, this was my hard work and kilometers on my car. Yes, kilometers, I am Canadian. So please use these in good faith in the spirit in which they're being given. That being said, uh, we're going to look, we'll just briefly look at the F1.4 image shot here with the, A, uh, the A1, sorry, at 15 seconds. Now keep in mind, this is a center crop, right? So it's an APS-C crop. If we had the full full frame image, it looks something like this. And here I don't see any noticeable uh, movement. I don't see any star trailing. If we zoom back in here, you know what? I also don't really notice any star trails for the most part. Now this will manifest a little bit differently depending on where you're pointed in the sky, but overall I would say F1.4, not bad. This is not an overly bright portion of the sky, mind you. Uh, this is in May, shot at zenith uh, around, what time was I shooting this? Two o'clock in the morning, so we're not getting a ton of exposure overall, but you know, it's not too bad. Let's zoom in. And okay, you can see a little bit of the star trailing. Couldn't see that zoomed out. This I think is perfectly acceptable. We do have a little bit of chromatic aberration. We'll talk about that more in the next section, but overall with that level of star trailing, I don't see any problem at a normal viewing distance if someone's seeing, and this is a crop, right? This is like an APS-C crop. So you might even be able to push this exposure longer. So if you're a tripod photographer, that is great. If you are looking to do tracked or tracked and stacked, etc., let's see what you got here. So 1.4, 60 second exposures, 60 megapixel camera. So right off the jump, we've got a bit of vignetting, but it's not actually that bad. You know, it is darker in the corners here, brighter in the center. But overall, I can still see a bit of exposure here in the corner, so I'm not too worried about that. I don't, right off the jump, think there's any real major loss of contrast. Sometimes you get that with some of Sigma's newer, faster lenses. I think like the 20 mil 1.4 released a few years ago, like wide open, it wasn't as, you know, it wasn't perfectly contrasty. Not big deal at all, but it is something to mention. Here I can see though, and as we notice there, some chromatic aberration. So let's look at this real close up. And here we can see, yeah, we've definitely got that purple fringing, chromatic aberration. Basically the lens isn't doing a great job getting all that light down into the pinpoint, so it's bloating out a little bit. 
and given us these purple stars, this is actually probably going to be fairly easy to fix. And um, here are some of the these pinky <laughs> pinker ones. That's well, you're getting a couple of different things happening here. It's going to be the time of night, whatever the uh, white balance of the camera I had set. I can't quite remember what it would have been. Star colors. So these things are going to change this a little bit, maybe. But all of that is in the raw. We can change that if we need to. But it's clear that these stars are a little brighter, probably a little uh, on the younger end of the spectrum, blue-white, nice and hot. So that light is getting bloated here into a blue halo. Doesn't look like there'd be any you know, notable sphere collaboration. And sphere collaborations, you can imagine if you cut a, uh, let's say, perfectly round sphere in half, you know, it's got that, that arc. A spherical lens, if you cut the lens element in half uh, of the same radius or some circumference or whatever, you would have a spherical arc. That side profile of an aspherical lens isn't going to be completely like a clean arc. It might have parts that have a slightly different profile, and that actually corrects for a lot of aberrations. But nothing's perfect, so there might be like a little spherical aberration interacting here. But you will notice it's always going to be the brighter stars, right? So next, let's look at the corners. Oh, look at that. We got a flock of seagulls. So this happens every video. This is the part where I tell you that this is not coma. This is not coma. Repeat after me. I'm not looking at coma. This is astigmatism. So I'll start with what is coma. Coma is when you have a star, and it's worth noting I don't really see any coma here, but you'll have a star, and it will, along an axis from the center to the edge, whatever axis goes through that star, it will have a wedge shape either pointing away from the center of the frame or towards. Towards is called internal, away is called external, and it will get fuzzy. It'll have like a fuzzy delta or fuzzy wedge shape. And that is comatic aberration, thus named because of a comet's tail, coma. So that's what coma actually is. You'll get this fuzziness and sometimes uh, it'll be towards the edges, sometimes it'll be towards the center. You won't have it both ways. And if it happens across the frame in the same direction, maybe it's all pointing to the left, let's say. You actually have a, it's a bigger problem with your lens, frankly, uh, that needs uh, maybe a readjustment or something like that. Or if it's, you know, especially inexpensive lens, that just might be part of the internal faults. But that being said, this is not coma. This is two types of astigmatism. So you'll notice all of these little space birds tend to be, you know, looking like they're flying towards the center of the frame, right? So here we have tangential astigmatism from the edges and to the center. There's a radius. The tangential astigmatism will be along that radius. The star is going to get stretched out in that direction. And what's happening is basically the lens can't focus that pinpoint into a pinpoint. Anyone who has astigmatism, I guess you probably have a very intimate uh, familiarity with this already. Here, what are the wings? The wings is called sagittal astigmatism. If you look at the navigator, sagittal astigmatism actually rings the frame, so it's essentially at a, a right angle to the tangential astigmatism. And often cases it'll curve, it might point in one direction or another, but it will always generally be in that axis. So tangential, sagittal astigmatism. Here, more sagittal right? The wings are quite wide on, on these stars, whereas the tangential stretching isn't that bad. Now, the problem that this causes is that it can be noticeable at regular viewing distances. Here, this is an especially bright star. It's a little bit extra, and uh, yeah, so <laughs> here we're getting a chromatic aberration as well. We're even getting a little bit of red chromatic aberration. So when they're really severe, they can cause a noticeable change to the star's shape and size. And that's where I find that they're most disruptive. And if you look from corner to corner, you'll see that they mostly, mostly stay the same shape, right? Generally the same shape. You're always gonna have some asymmetries across the frame. It, it's just a fact of things that aren't perfect that are made by humans in a factory. But in this case, it's not too bad. 
but you can notice them. So, eh, is that going to bother you? Well, that's why you're watching this to find out. Here, you know, pretty close to the center of the frame actually, and we're still getting that stretching, right? It's not bad tracking. If you look at the center of the frame, tracking is bang on. So, even a third of the way out, yeah, things are, are getting stretched. It is a 12 year old lens. Let's give it a bit of a, a break, but you know, from this viewing distance, am I really noticing? No. In fact, based on our, our look at that untracked sample, I might actually think that this lens would perform better untracked than tracked because as those stars do trail a little bit, they're going to essentially smear out these aberrations and make them not as bad. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, that being said, let's go look through and see if ha anything happens as we stop down. So this is f1.4, 1.6. We definitely have a little bit more even exposure here in the middle. We've got more contrast back now. 1.8, things are starting to even out across the frame. F2, it's pretty even. There's always going to be that vignetting because the corners don't get as, as exposed. But 2.2, 2.5, and yeah, the fact that we don't have 2.8 here isn't that big of a deal because to be perfectly blunt, I don't think you should be shooting this high. Let's look at what happens here in the corners at 2.5. Oof, so that's not really even resolving the astigmatism. That's, we're pretty stopped down at this point. And sure, you can see that sagittal as we uh, flip through here. Definitely as you stop down, those wings come in a little bit, but they don't completely disappear even by 2.5. And I, I just don't think going much past that would be useful. So in this case, if you, can't live with this, don't use this lens. If you can, by all means, use this lens. So one last thing before we pop into the develop module, I'm just going to take a peek at the star size basically, pop out to the edges. Now obviously it's very dark here. You can see the star size. We do have that astigmatism. Middle, edge, middle, other edge, now, one nice thing about this, even though we do have the astigmatism, I don't think we have any field curvature. What is field curvature? Well, that is just a, a fact of life when using lenses. We have a set of curved pieces of glass or whatnot making the lens up, trying to project an image on a flat sensor. It's not really going to work perfectly. So when you have, let's say, the center in focus, if you have a lot of field curvature, you will find that you might lose focus at the edges and corners. And then if you were to focus at the edge or corner, you'd lose focus in the center. There might be like a happy medium. In this case, you don't really have to worry about it. Here, the astigmatism is by far the main event. But uh, overall, less, less aberrations are better, I'd say. Let's pop into develop here real quick. Here, we're going to take a look at some lens corrections. Uh, first, actually, I've got a white balance problem here. I had my camera set to auto white balance, I think, and it just chose uh, kind of a wonky white balance. Just going to click auto. This isn't a more correct white balance. Well, maybe it actually is, but it is definitely more neutral. Just going to make this part a little bit less painful because we are going to go on a hunt for some chromatic aberration. Here we go. We found some. So here you've got this purple fringe, like it's looking terrible. Let's come over here to our lens corrections. Remove chromatic aberration. Does nothing. <laughs> I did know that was going to happen because often with, with these purple fringes like this, it won't immediately get rid of them. But you can come over here to defringe, click on the eyedropper, and click. And instantly, things are a little bit better. You can see, while it won't deal with any of the bloating, it will get rid of some of that color. Let's look over here. Yeah, some of that bluey purple. Yeah, it's pretty well corrected now. Here we can see that the stars actually had some color to them. Uh, in the previous examples, you'll see, that, I mean, the white balance was off a little bit, but they're more just blue and green. Here now you see they're a little bit more yellow and orange and blue. It's probably more correct. And while it doesn't do anything to get rid of the astigmatism, it at least gets rid of that extra color, which might be distracting. Okay, so that's our first set of corrections. Now we're going to do the profile corrections.
All right, so I'm seeing some geometry correction, but not as much vignetting correction as I think it needs. So here when we enable the corrections, the vignetting is getting a little bit brushed up, but it's not, you know, it's not perfect. Here, you can see this better in the navigator. And in fact, I don't think the, the built-in tool here is maybe enough to deal with the, um, oh yeah, look at that. I don't think it's able to actually deal with the pattern of the vignetting. So this for vignetting eh, might require a custom mask. I'll, I'll leave that up to you. But one thing it is doing is changing the geometry. So this lens has some barrel distortion. Center of the lens, or center of the frame here, looks like it's kind of bulbous out towards the viewer. And when we enable the profile correction, it flattens it away from the viewer. When we're looking here, the edges are pushed away from the viewer a bit. When we enable the profile correction, they're pulled towards the viewer, makes things a little bit more even across the frame. And if we zoom out here, you can actually see what's going on. So it's subtly stretching the corners out, but it's not too bad. And I'll flick it on and off. Watch the stars on the edges, top edges, and then side edges and corners if you'd like. And so while I do this, you'll notice the stars at the top and bottom of the frame don't move. So there, we're not losing any uh, field of view that way. On the edges over here, you are losing a little, little smidge. And in the corners, you're losing a smidge, but that's by far uh, not a big deal. I would say besides the unique vignetting here that might require a little bit more work to clean up, probably the biggest knock against this lens is the astigmatism, that sagittal astigmatism, uh, wide open, but I mean, even stop down is, is always gonna be present. So you gotta decide, are you able to live with that? And that's up to you. All right, back to talking head, Darren. Well, what'd you think? Is that what you expected? For me, it's about what I expected, to be honest. The The lens, while the beginning of the art series is, oof, what is it, 2012 or something like that? It's been around a while. Things have progressed as far as technology and lens design and manufacturing since then. So while it is a great lens, uh, it might not be the prime lens for astrophotography. I apologize. I'm so sorry. That being said, uh, it, there are applications that I can see this lens doing quite well. And if you're using a lower megapixel camera, any aberrations will get hidden a little bit further. If you're doing you know, static tripod shots, the star trailing might help blur some of those aberrations as well. And you know what? It could be used to make some very beautiful art. So that's up to you. I'm just here to take the samples and talk for a few minutes and let you decide what you want to do. So I'm Darren, this is Fervent Astronomy. Hopefully we'll see you in the next one.